Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. I'm joined today, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, a best selling author, and hey, he's also my dad. So, dad, how are you doing today? I'm really good. And one thing that makes it really good is this opportunity to talk with Dr. John Rady, who's a world class expert on ADHD and remarkably, a world-class expert on several other things as well. So this should be a really good conversation. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this one a lot. We've somehow made it this far in the history of the podcast without having a formal ADHD episode, a true oversight on our part, but we've been waiting to talk about it with somebody like John. So Dr. John Rady is an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, an internationally recognized expert in neuropsychiatry, and the author of 11 books, including Spark and the Driven to Distraction series with Dr. Ned Hallowell. When Driven to Distraction first came out in 1992, it really truly revolutionized popular understanding of ADHD. And John and Ned recently released their newest book in the series, ADHD 2.0, which if you're watching the video is right behind me right now. And it's probably worth mentioning here that Dr. Rady and Dr. Hallowell are speaking from their own experience because they themselves have ADHD. So John, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm here in Hawaii and uh, loving the weather uh, <laughs> and want to share with everybody, but uh, can't do that. But <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited about uh, about seeing Rick again. Uh, it's been too long, so uh, glad to be back with you. And your podcast sounds great, and your son is wonderful. Oh, thank you, John. <laughs> That was like the the most earnest introduction we've like ever gotten on the show. That's fantastic. Uh, I've got the atmospheric river, by the way, going outside of the window right now. So if you hear a bit of wind in the background, that's what's going on. And uh, anyways, to start the kind of content of the podcast today, we have come uh, a very long way in the popular understanding of ADHD since Driven to Distraction came out roughly 30-ish years ago. What do you think remain some of the biggest misunderstandings or misconceptions that people have about ADHD? I mean, there, there are misconceptions everywhere, amongst the populace, yeah. amongst patients, and amongst psychiatrists and other doctors. Some doctors still say they don't believe in ADHD, which is, you know, freaks us out. Don't believe in ADHD. When, when we, even when we wrote driven to distractions, it was the most research uh, disorder in all of medicine, and certainly in psychiatry, and certainly in child psychiatry, but people still don't believe it because they, they because everybody has a bit of it, right? Everybody doesn't have enough attention, and they can relate to it, and they just say, buck up, you know, get with mm. it, and I think that's still uh, a really big issue with ADHD because there's so many people that can be helped just by being aware that this is a, their, their quirky kind of brain that has many benefits and many problems, uh, or not even problems, but difficulties and sometimes problems. Uh, but the benefits are, are great. And so people need to know that, that it is real and uh, it can be helped quite significantly just by understanding and beginning to to make up their own plan for their way their brain works. So you mentioned a second ago the word benefits, and that gets to something that I really appreciated about your approach, because to be disclosing, and it's something that she's talked about publicly, uh, my partner Elizabeth has ADHD. She was diagnosed with it semi-recently, relatively late in life. And when you first start encountering it as a diagnosis, there's a set of symptomology that people commonly attribute to it that, uh, for starters, can sound pretty dire and can sound pretty negative. It could sound like, you know, you're kind of messed up in the head and, hey, this is just something that you're going to have to deal with for the rest of your life. But what I really appreciate about your work is that you guys take a really uh, strengths-oriented approach in the book, and you're very clear about these benefits that can be associated with ADHD, even framing it from time to time as like an evolutionary advantage in certain kinds of situations. And I was hoping you could take a moment to kind of explain that to people because it was just really helpful for me personally. It really can be, and it is an advantage. Many of our 
I mean, our computer, for instance, which we're talking on, right, is made by a lot of ADHD people. <laughs> our offices were right next to MIT in Cambridge. And this was during the time of the evolution of uh, of the computer. And uh, we had a lot of people from MIT, both students and professors, who sought our services. And the MIT medical faculty had us come over there to talk to them, to educate them about ADHD. And this is in the 80s, right? And uh, beginning the 90s. And they, we were just sort of recognizing that you didn't have to be a child to have ADHD. Super bright people like we saw at MIT and at Harvard, uh, they could compensate for it. So it, it uh, never was missed. It was seen as they were quirky or, you know, four plus brilliant and no one could understand them. They, they had pro problems, you know, even with IQs of plus 160 with uh, getting things done with beginning distracted, with getting too angry, with getting too overwhelmed, with ruminating too much, all the problems that we also see with ADHD. So I got a copy of your book. I was a newly minted licensed psychologist, I think when your book came out. It was kind of my Bible in a lot of ways. And I wanna share with you an understanding of this territory and to check it with you, okay? So I think of normal, neurological, temperamental variation, you know, constitutional variation of temperaments. And so if we think of three dimensions, uh, impulsivity, distractibility, and stimulation seeking, we can think of people on a range of those dimensions. And we could think of people who then cluster high on distractibility. And then, as you well know, there's kind of a related cluster high on impulsivity and stimulation seeking, and then a cluster of all three, high on distractibility, high on impulsivity, and high on stimulation seeking. They're just at that end of the normal temperamental range. So for me, that's how I've thought about it. And it's not good or bad. It's a, it's a matter of functionality and fit. And I've reflected that through evolution, uh, in which our human and then hominid ancestors lived in small hunter-gatherer bands. It was actually adaptive to have temperamental diversity in the bands. And um, the problem today is one of fit, that to be someone who in a hunter-gatherer environment or 100 years ago, maybe in a more rural setting, was just wonderful, creative, kind of impulsive, looking for the new thing, active. That was wonderful, but it's tough to be that 10-year-old or six-year-old kid in a standard conventional classroom or 30 years later in a corporate cubicle. So it's not so much a D for a disorder that's located within an individual, it's more like a pragmatic problem of fit. And then a question of skillful means in terms of helping people with all that. And so anyway, that's been kind of a framing for me that's been depathologizing. It may be skillful means to take medication, okay. It may be skillful means to teach a person you know, forms of self-regulation, uh, executive functions, things like that. It's not because there's something internally wrong with the person or, or pathologizing about it. So for me, anyway, this frame has been really helpful. And I wondered what you thought about it. That's that's a good way to think of it. It's it's very close to the way we think of it. And uh, But you're so right, you know, in, as a hunter-gatherer, ADD was very useful uh, because of the high energy because of the exploring need, wish, drivenness to, to do it, to try something new. Uh, let's go see what's happening. Um, let's be the first, let's push the envelope. And uh, this is why so many of our innovators have this trait. The, the reason why we have the computer now, so much of it was done by dyslexics, ADHD people, and autistic people folks or high on this, each of those spectrums. And, and it's all about motive, innovation, innovation, looking for something new, sticking with it, having a, a good idea, and hopefully having enough support to follow it up. Yeah. And so you're speaking here to a couple of things that people might not think of. 
as uh, in the image that they have in their head of what ADHD looks like. You're talking about innovation. You mentioned earlier, I think, uh, moodiness or something similar, rumination, like a ruminatory cycle that somebody can get trapped in. So you give a phenomenal list in ADHD 2.0 of a variety of, uh, I, I don't even really want to call them symptoms, but like presentations that ADHD can take that people might be a bit less familiar with. And I was wondering if you could share a couple more of them because I, I just thought that they were really interesting how people think of it as like an attentional trait, but really we're talking about a whole brain difference of one kind or another. And so that can that can seep into a lot of different areas of life. Well, you know, look, let's look what it's confused with. Often. It's, it's confused with depression. It's confused with anxiety. It's confused with manic depression the bipolar, the, the swings of mood and, and all, and the swings down into feeling bad and feeling bad about themselves, feeling like they're failures when they're certainly not. One of the issues that we really focused on in ADHD 2.0 is rumination. People can get mm. trapped in, mm -hmm. these, in, in, in these thoughts and uh, and, and some, sometimes that's a good idea. You know, it leads to them completing new new areas but it can also be catch you into uh, repeat again and again of some bad news that you're you're trying to deal with and also they they can be seen as as being insensitive because they're so moving so inside their brain uh from one thing to another so they they forget to do things that are commonly uh, expected like being polite and it's not for want of, you know, thinking they're better than anybody else, but it just they they're they're moving on to the next issue, the next feeling, the next person, the next idea. Yeah. So this list in the book, I just think is really fantastic. So I'm going to name a couple of things on it because they're all the things that you would expect: unexplained underachievement, wandering mind, trouble organizing and planning, trouble with time management, sort of the typical things that people say, okay, that's an image that I have of somebody with ADHD. But then you have all of these other things that are really beautiful, like a high degree of creativity and imagination, generosity, a unique and active sense of humor. And then you have some other things that are kind of a mixed bag, an exquisite sensitivity to criticism or rejection, this rejection sensitivity that you talk about in the book honesty to a fault, high energy, um, even things like a susceptibility to addiction. People with ADHD are somewhere between five and 10 times more likely to develop various addictions in the course of their life than people without. Um, but I just thought that it was such an interesting list. Yeah, there, there, there's a wide variety of things that could go wrong or could be seen as, 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 a, as a problem or as a benefit. I was really struck by something in ADHD 2.0 because partly I'm a brain geek. And so you were talking about these two systems in the brain, the task positive network and the default mode network. And you talked about issues that can uh, occur for people. And I got to tell you, as a quick sidebar, I reflexively resist that last D because I don't think that it's inherently a disorder. Uh, I think it's an issue of fit you know, um, and so forth. So I resist that. And I, <laughs> I prefer actually more of the spirited end of the spectrum because statistically, if someone is in the top 1% or 3%, let's say, of impulsivity, distractibility, and stimulation seeking, you know, they're at a certain point in the normal temperamental range. Uh, but it's not that there's something wrong with them. So I'm just I'm gonna really what was, <laughs> buckle what was your down preferred into that title viewpoint. for it, John? It was variable attention stimulus trait. Was it that? Right. Vast. Yeah, Rick, Rick that's Vast. our preface in our book about uh, the yeah, fact sweet. that it's, I it's love not that. a good name and it's not a good way to pathologize it, that it is just what you're saying, that it, it's a, it is a trait and a trait gone wild is a way to think of it as a disorder. Uh, you know, too much of it uh, can get you, get, get people into trouble and they have a diagnosis of it begins to interfere with they're living and interfere with them doing well. Pragmatically, I fully recognize the issues of fit, um, but the, where we locate the, the problem and also the language of, frankly, medicine that's inherently oriented around, you know, disease and dysfunction and 
you know, and, and treating it tends to pathologize the individual. So I'm I'm going to wave the banner that I I think you'll support. But whoop back to the brain. Uh, can you just unpack for for a general audience the test positive network, the default mode network, and the particular ways that people who are kind of high on the I'll say spirited end of the temperamental spectrum, you know, their how their brains operate. Yeah. Now, we, there, there are lots of different networks in the brain, and it's a new way of, of really thinking about the brain, unpacking the brain in general. The biggest one, the one we know that started the whole issue back in 2006, was something called the default mode network. And, and basically, it shows on the fMRI scan, fancy, fancy scan, when they, they put people in the fMRI, they say, just let your mind wander. And that becomes the signature, right? Well, they noticed that these signatures were very were similar and exactly the same in some people, one to another, that one part of the brain, the back part of the brain, and the front part of the brain uh, were all allied. And this became known as the default mode. When you're not thinking about anything, when you're not focused on anything, this, this area of the brain lights up. Now, in that default mode, you have a, your, your, your history of what you've done, what you care about, what, what's, what's important to you. And in the front part, that's in the back part of your brain, in the front part of your brain is where you make plans. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm intending to do that. Um, and throughout, though, there's a, a, a constant chatter. It's always talking. It's always commenting. It's always driving you to something. Then and there is another key network for ADD, the test positive network, which is where our attention lies. And this is involved with the really the front part of the brain where we talk about we're having our executive functions. And, and, and for a while there, ADHD or ADD was called executive function disorder, which I don't never knew how they were separate but, uh, because it's so much dependent on one another. But anyway, we're into making up new diagnoses uh, <laughs> all the time. It's a know. vast opportunity for you. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Yeah. Well, and so what you have, what we know about the brain is that when you Get into this test positive network. Your default mode network simmers down, shuts up. The energy seems to go to your attention in the neurotypical case. With ADD, that's a very different finding. That the, the energy doesn't go away from the default mode most of the time. And so it's constantly pulling the, the information from the frontal cortex back into the default mode. Uh, so it pulls it away from the attention. And that's, yeah. Yeah. that struggle is really what I find so illuminating by this group of metaphors in terms of our understanding of the brain and how this might impact our understanding of ADHD. It's been very helpful to use that metaphor group to explain to patients. They, they look at that and they say, oh my God, that's exactly what happens. That I'm thinking about something and I'm being pulled back to some irrelevant stuff or some very relevant stuff or, oh, I forgot to turn the stove off or, oh, I'm a bad person because I didn't excel in this course or that course or whatever it is. And so that's why you get people who can't stay attentive. Just so you know, I, I, I laughingly think of the default mode network as the simulator or the ruminator, right? And um, one thing you may know, interestingly, is that when people engage in interoception, they tune in to, let's say, the internal sensations of breathing, uh, that engages the insula, which acts a little bit like a circuit breaker and reduces activity in the default mode network. And maybe later on, um, well, we'll talk more about practical things, including getting in touch with the body through exercise and so forth. Yeah, that was super helpful, John. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah, no, the sort of the three ways to shut up the default mode, and that's the way I think of it. Just shut up. Leave me alone. I'm thinking I want to think about this. Don't worry about that later, you know. Let me go. <laughs> Quit sucking me back in. Right, exactly. It's, it, 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 it is like a magnet. It's pulling, pulls you away from that. Anyway, it's, it's three ways just in general, and it's practical. Meditation, where your interoceptive stuff comes in. Exercise or movement which is a big way to shut the whole default mode up and medication. Uh, mm. You know, those are, that's what, that, those are tried and true ways of, of, of allowing your attention to function better. And that's mm. all it is. And remain in the present because in yes. effect, you're saying as soon as we get pulled into the, the ruminator, you know, the default mode, we're no longer in present moment awareness. Yeah, now, now the default mode is a great, great tool, right? It's a center for innovation and creativity. But when we started looking at the default mode, I did, and uh, trying to understand it, they, they uh, got a group of people who were really sort of far to the, to the success of meditators. They were, they were among the best meditators. Uh, and, and their default modes when they looked at their fMRI was almost absent, you know, and, and, and it's because they were so trained in meditation where they were just focusing on the present being and, and not being bothered, not being pulled away by internal BS. So you're, you're naming these like, there are these two different common symptoms that can be associated with ADHD. One of them is this, uh, this suction from the default mode, you know, being pulled back into the ruminator, as you were kind of calling it. And then sometimes people can fall into the opposite situation. I've, I've certainly seen Elizabeth do this from time to time, where it's the task positive network that gets hyper overactivated and you fall into the, the hyper focus trap door. So you've got this intense right. overactivation of each network kind of independent of the other, if that sort of makes sense, that people with ADHD can can get pulled into while more neurotypical brains are a little bit more adept. And please correct me if I'm wrong here, John, at switching back forth, back and forth between these modes or them using them as checks on each other. Is that more or less accurate? Well, it's more or less accurate, but you know, and it always gets confusing when you talk about rumination because that's that's where a person gets stuck but it's driven by feelings, okay? But which is, you know, it's 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 a feeling state rather than just a focus state. Yes. The beauty of ADHD is you get an idea, and if you can really hyper focus on it, if you can remain on it, then you can bring it to completion. That's why you'll see ADHD people saying, "Leave me alone! I'm thinking about this. Don't yeah. bother me." I want to get this down. So talking about the role of the feelings that you were mentioning a second ago, one of the things that really stuck out to me about the book was how much you and Ned focused on the importance of social connection, warm support oh, from other people, feeling in relationship, all of that. That just really stood out to me. It is the most important part of life for any of the psychiatric problems, any, any trip along the wellness pathway. The best part of it is is what we call vitamin C, which is connection. Uh, how important that is for health, physical health, and mental health. You know, there's nothing stronger than being connected to another person or another group or the family or the extended family or something larger than oneself. I was ruminating over here about... <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> about the particular benefits for people at the high spirited, let's say, end of this temperamental range of social contact. And I was started, I was thinking about polyvagal theory and the vagus nerve complex and the ways in which the social engagement system, when that's really active, then uh, is helpful in terms of the earliest branch of the vagus nerve complex in terms of regulating the viscera and calming and centering. Uh, and, and with greater, you know, tone, parasympathetic tone, activation of the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system. So I began wondering about, huh, 
in your view or understanding, uh, could there be particular benefits for people at the high spirited end of the spectrum of heartfelt experiences in the ways that those are regulatory and centering and calming and drawing people into the present and thus moderating some of the excesses of kind of being out there at the end of that temperamental range? Certainly, 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 certainly. The, you, you go both ways. You go from up, upside down, downside up. In other words, mm-hmm. if you calm the viscera down, you're, you're going to be more in a state, nice state of equilibrium, and, and it goes both ways. So, yeah, no, there, there certainly, certainly, it, and that's one of the benefits of of meditation, of exercise, of medication. You know, they all can help still the the body, and that's what I've spent a good part of my life writing about, and thinking about is is how our body plays such a big role in consciousness, in our feelings, in our thinking, with exercise and with interest in, you know, the with connections. There's a feeling of, you know, it's okay. Your body's okay. You're, you're feeling less, less jazz. Less threatened. There's a soothing aspect, yeah. Yeah, and that then leads to an improvement in our attention. That's partly drove me to my my time spent worrying about, thinking about, writing about exercise. In all of our books, in our four books, ADD, exercise is always near the top of of things that we can do to make our bodies and our brains work better. You know, obvious point here, if you have a brain that works a bit differently than 90% of the population, it's going to be really easy to feel like an outsider. And one of the things about ADHD is that it's it's socially punished in a lot of different ways, in ways that some other uh, points of difference are not necessarily socially punished. It tends to be quite obvious. It tends to get pointed out in the classroom environment. Uh, it tends to get uh, punished, sometimes corporally punished by parents. And it can be very hard to to live with in that way. And because of that, it's very easy, like I said a second ago, to just feel like an outsider and to feel like you're taking essentially a lot of abuse for just a function of the way that you are. And we talk about on the podcast pretty regularly about different kinds of, you know, restorative or reparative emotional experiences and how that can be particularly important for for people who have a deficit of that um, or who are maybe taking on more painful emotional experiences than than other people are. And so that's maybe another part of the uh, why is connection so important for for people who have ADHD puzzle. Oh yeah, no, absolutely, and 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 that's that's the legacy of so many of our ADHD adults is having that kind of being the oddball, and the feeling that they're abnormal, normal, uh, you know, that things are different for them than than the rest of the world, uh, and they then think that that's something wrong, and usually, like you're saying, in the classroom, and even with parents, and and uh, certainly in other areas that they're judged as being wrong, as bad, as defective. That's why it's so important to rehabilitate the ADHD from the the disorder bin and and look at it as a an extreme of a trait that it becomes a disorder when it disorders your disrupts your life, and that that's all that's all that it is. You know, I spend a lot of time in schools, John. Um, to, you know, mainly elementary schools, some high schools, secondary schools, and routinely as sort of the functioning school psychologist, the primary referral source would be this bright third grader who couldn't sit still, et cetera. And when I think about that child or the variation, which was more common in girls, as you know, who was not stimulation seeking and impulsive, but was dreamy and inattentive with this wonderfully rich inner world in the simulator, right? In that default mode world. In either case, uh, what I would observe in the classroom and I would hear in their home life is that they were getting dinged 20 times a day. They were disappointing. They didn't get something done. They were getting, they were annoying. They were unruly. They were being corrected. They were being brought back. 
20 times a day at least, they were having some kind of painful, usually mild, but it just, the quantity was extraordinary. And that gradually leaves emotional residues inside people, as you well know, um, by the time they land in adulthood. Uh, one of the takeaways for me was about being extraordinarily thoughtful about that if, if your child is in this more spirited or inattentive, you know, range of things. And balancing, you know, particularly given the brain's negativity bias, go after that three to one, five to one, 10 to one ratio of positive to negative interactions from the perspective of that child. Really important. So now as adults, though, there's this backlog, there's this residue inside. And as you know myself, I'm very interested in deliberate internalization of beneficial experiences and engaging um, evidence-based neurological factors to heighten internalization, social, emotional learning, including to heal that backlog of wear and tear on your sense of who you are and, and accumulation of you know, emotionally negative experiences, which can wear down mood over time. The problem though, is for someone to actually internalize a beneficial experience, they need to typically stay with it for at least a handful of seconds in a row unlike negative experiences that go right in, and it becomes a difficulty. How do you help people stay with that beneficial experience of accomplishment or inclusion or being valued or being cool, et cetera, when their mind is skittering onto the next thing, uh, particularly if they happen to also be very bright and giftedness then masquerades, as you said earlier, as an issue of attention, when in fact they got it already, they're onto the next one or thing, you know? And so for me, it's actually been really important for people who are more on this end of the spirited range to help themselves really slow it down for a breath or two or longer, feeling it in their body and taking it in when they do have opportunities to have experiences today that are reparative and antidoting and compensatory for the painful experiences they've had previously. The connection allows that to uh, maybe allows that in past yeah. the filters, past the noise, past the the chatterbox, you know, oh yeah, so, oh, I was loved, or oh, I'm okay, oh, I really did this for that person, I really was, was good. You know, recently a, a patient tells me of his parents who didn't understand him at all, but, you know, he's super bright and but he got criticized for not studying, but yet getting A pluses. You know, it was like, that was the point of criticism from, from a parent saying that this is un, unnatural. And if that happens early enough, this is now first grade, this was happening to him, right? So you get these early areas of, of oh, I'm, I'm defective, I'm not good, I'm, you know, not normal. Uh, in there, and those those rever you know reverberate around, and that becomes part of your default mode and part of the chatterbox that's always you know there operating. A huge part of your work, John, has been focused on, like you were saying earlier, exercise and movement as a tool for people, um, just for for all kinds of different brains. Maybe particularly for people who have ADHD, but it's applicable broadly, of course. I mean. Uh, the earliest known medical textbook that we have comes from a Hippocrates, and he was writing about exercise as a treatment for depression back in whatever it was, 300 AD or 300 BC. I probably got my numbers wrong, but whatever it was. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, why is exercise particularly useful maybe for dealing with some of the problems that arise with ADHD? And then we can get into talking about exercise more in general. We handed our book in and, and the uh, our editor wisely said, oh, you have to cut at least two thirds of it. Uh, wow. So we did. Uh, but what survived are two of the nine chapters are on exercise. So they survived because they're so potent as an intervention, as, as some, something to do to help repair the process. Uh, just general exercise and then working on balance and rhythm and uh, coordination in, in the cerebellum. Very important areas that are, that are just blossoming today. You know, I see you know, maybe a month ago, another study out of Australia, big study looking at girls 
uh, who exercised versus those who didn't and looking at their attention. And by far, those who exercised a lot got better attention scores than those who didn't. But we're seeing this again and again and again. It's not like that's new news, but it's regurgitated into the present. This is what we see when we, we've gone into schools and, and shifted around the priorities and maybe even the timing of uh, recess and exercise that uh, the first thing that you get when we went into so many of these schools and had them shift where they spent 30 minutes in the morning exercising, what happens? Imme almost immediately drops disciplinary problems. Disciplinary problems. Why? Because, not because the kids are tired. They're tired out. No, their brains are more switched on. Their brains are activated. And when their brains are activated, they, they want to be in the moment more. They want to be present more. And the second thing that happens is that they do better in, in, in schoolwork and all that. You know, and, and this is what we've seen again and again and again. So much of our brain is, is when you look at it, is involved with movement. So when you're, and, so, and especially what we think of as the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of the brain, the moving brain is the thinking brain. And this is what we see. So that when you're moving, you're activating your brain and those parts of the brain that are really activated when you're moving are the parts that are involved with thinking, with memory, with learning, with, uh, you know, uh, succeeding in life. Are there particular kinds of of exercise that are particularly good for people with ADHD or is it just pick whatever works for you, something's better than nothing? Oh, the something's always better than nothing, but uh yeah, every individual is so different. I mean, it it is about it is about moving because your muscles then activate your brain to move all the way from jump rope to swimming to running to biking to dance, which we talk about dance as being probably the best exercise you can do because it act it demands so much of your brain. Dance yeah. does. Because you have to focus your movements. You have to pay attention to the music. You have to move correctly. And in space with someone usually or with a group. You know, unless you're doing boomer dancing, you know, where you just flail around. <laughs> we, lo we love a good wedding dance here, John. We're not going to look down <laughs> yeah. at a good wedding dance. You know, you're in the corner, you're doing your thing. It's all okay. <laughs> so I don't think that you actually know this, John. Uh, so this is going to be so fun. But um, my my hobby background is actually in dancing. Um, I have a, a serious hobby. I do a style of dance called West Coast Swing. Before then, I did uh, various styles of ballroom. And I actually met my partner, Elizabeth, through dancing. And I'm going to paint you a, a kind of case study picture here. And you can let me know what you think about it. Uh, Elizabeth, for most of her life, has been involved in various kinds of dance. She started doing hula when she was, I think, like six, seven years old. And uh, then she transitioned into other forms of dance as she aged, including uh, doing Argentine tango and a, a variety of different uh, styles of dance that came along a little bit later for her. And then we met uh, basically through West Coast Swing, which is the dance that we do now. And then the pandemic hit. All of the dancing shut down. Every Because understandably, you know, you can't be in close contact with people. And uh, all of a sudden, Elizabeth is starting to feel these different symptoms pop up in different kinds of ways. Oh, maybe I'm having a hard time focusing and it's really tough for me to be kind of like in this closed in space for a long period of time. This eventually leads to us getting a formal diagnosis for ADHD. And one of the kind of pet theories that we've had is that all of the movement that she was doing was essentially treating a lot of the underlying symptomology. And so when that got taken away, all of a sudden the symptoms showed up in a in a more thorough way. Now she's for her entire life had some ADHD symptoms and looking at the the list in your book and other uh, formal lists of symptoms, she's been very able to look at that and go, oh yeah, that's always been me, but this was how I essentially medicated myself. 
So I just want to kind of affirm your uh, your take here, John, by giving our own our own case study uh, on the podcast. It's it's amazing. I'm I'm going over to Korea, South Korea, for uh, twelve days. A large part of it is about using movement in schools uh, in Korea, uh, and meeting with the K-pop dancers, uh, the mm. old K-pop move. Very cool. Uh, which is a really a very active dance. But yeah, no, it's 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 really clear that that if you're moving, uh, your your brain is so much more active and so much better. Uh, that was my first index case, by the way. I'll, I'll quickly try to describe it. When I was a second, right, second year out of residency in 1982, I was talking about ADHD and ADD at that point and at a cocktail party, and I was saying, you know, I think a lot of adults have it, and I was talking about it because I'd seen some patients had been taken off their medicine, et cetera. And this guy said, can I come see you? And I said, uh, of course. Uh, he's a very famous uh, professor at Harvard and MIT and a MacArthur fellow. It's a lot of good credentials. He came in and he said, look, I grew up being a marathoner. I'm, I'm a marathoner all my life, but I hurt my knee. And I haven't been running for you know months and months and months. And I have all the symptoms of what you talk about of ADHD. Can I come and see you? And so he did and little medicine, then his rehabbing occurred, you know, he got better and better and better. And, and I saw him, you know, continue to see him for a number of years. And he was absolutely fine when he got back to running. He did his seven miles a day, you know, and, and didn't need the medicine anymore. Just as your, as your partner, um, has the same story, but that led me on my chase for exercise and for ADHD. And uh, if somebody's listen, listening to this and going, well, seven miles sounds like an awful lot for me. You know, your partner, Elizabeth, semi-professional dancer, professional dancer for a long time. Wow. That's a, that's a big exercise regimen. How much is a, is a good dose of exercise to you, John? Anywhere from five to 20 minutes, just, uh, you know, the, what I, what I tell people, especially younger kids and, and older kids is get a jump rope, get a jump rope. I just, I talk about it in spark, uh, this, this gal who I didn't see the mother who had eighty day and she was very active, et cetera, but her daughter was in fourth grade, really bright kid, but was having trouble with math. And I said, well, give me the scenario. And so every time she'd sit down to do her math homework, she'd get frustrated and throw everything on the floor and you know, have a tantrum. And I said, have her start off with jump rope. So she did five or 10 minutes of jump rope and she ended up doing very well in math. And she's now a master's level nurse who also was on a regional jump rope team. Uh, hey. she, <laughs> <laughs> Love that. She she traveled all over the United States doing jump rope. So that's um, awesome. But it's a great way to do movement, to work on balance and coordination, just like dance. I mean, it it's it's it it, it really fits the bill for for our brain. So you don't need to do a lot of it. And those starting on jump rope, whatever your age is, it, it takes a while. Just be patient with yourself. So I know we're, we're going to be wrapping up pretty soon, but I want to slip in two topics for sure, if we can, before you go. And the first of those has to do with um, one of my favorites of your book, uh, books, Go Wild, right? And I love the subtitle, Free Your Body and Mind from the Afflictions of Civilization. And going back to our hunter-gatherer past, and obviously we're not gonna to return to the Stone Age, but we can learn lessons from the way people live 97% of the 300,000 years that people like you and I have walked the earth, right? Until agriculture rolled in around 10,000 years ago. Um, I've been very struck by the ways in which, uh, I would say this informally, people I know who are definitely real high on the spirited end of the spectrum, including impulsive, 
uh, stimulation seeking, even aggressive, do really well in wilderness. Uh, there's something about the wild that settles. And I just wonder what your take is about that, being in, being in wilderness, even just walking in the park. There's a chapter in, in Go Wild about called biophilia, which is our, our natural love of biology, of, of nature, of being in nature. And uh, the Asians have developed this over time to a treatment. Uh, the, the Japanese call it forest bathing, uh, where they've taken all these high-pressured executives from uh, Tokyo out into one of the many, many forests in, in Japan to spend time there, not, not just talking to trees and hugging them, but being around them. And uh, yeah, there is a, a, a nature deficit disorder that we all have, uh, most of us living in our, you know, the cities. And, and so one of the things we talk about in exercise, the best kind of exercise is something that you do with somebody and outside, and uh, you know, both of which will help bring you back to it, uh, especially doing it with somebody. One thing I speculate about that um, real briefly here is that uh, a lot of the activity in the default mode network is self-referential, including in mental time travel, reflecting about yourself in the past, projecting yourself into the future, and one of the things that happens that you, you may well know already neurologically is that when people move their gaze outward, including toward the horizon line, that naturally reduces self-referential processing, which is going to naturally reduce activity in the default mode network. And that's what happens when you're out in nature. Your, your, your gaze moves out, tends to move up. You're taking in a lot more information. There's less of that self-referential preoccupation all of which, kawoosh, now you're in the present. Absolutely. It, it's, it's not just having your gaze up, but also watching where you're stepping. You know, yeah. that's a big thing for me. Being in the present. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's a big thing. My goodness. Well, it's a great metaphor for, uh, for life more broadly, not getting tripped up by a root. But one of the things that I wanted to, to ask you about at the end of the conversation here, John, is something that Elizabeth and I have talked a lot about, which is medication um, and whether or not people should consider using medication of one kind or another for ADHD. Uh, a lot of people have concerns about going on a form of medication. They're concerned about side effects. They're just broadly a little freaked out by psychiatry, just in general, which, which I understand. Uh, there might be a little fear about interacting with something that's really going to affect how your brain functions. There's a lot of stuff out there about the potential to get uh, addicted to a stimulant or whatever it is that's going on there. And so I just wanted to ask you broadly, how do you think about medication at this point as somebody who's also engaged all of these other more, quote unquote, holistic interventions for ADHD? That's the other side of the coin. I mean, it because there are a lot of Psychiatrists who will sit, who will support. Oh, you shouldn't go on medicine if you have ADD. You know, just buck up or find another way. But if you if you have a serious case of attention problems, medicine can be a life changer, and it can be very quick. Don't discount it at all. You know, if necessary, it's 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 very very useful. And the the issues that you raise, the side effects, and the stair step to addiction, uh, you know, the, the side effects are very minimal. It's like a big cup of coffee, you know, and in fact, coffee has more side effects than does most of our stimulants, okay? It has more side effects. Uh, and uh, it's harder to, when it wears off, than the stimulants. <laughs> but, no, really, really. It's, it's no, really I can true. speak to and, that from personal experience. I've gotten a good caffeine headache every once in a while. It's not fun. Yeah, yeah. But about addiction, that's very important. And we stress this in our book. We had a lot in, in the book that was cut by two thirds, uh, even more, because addiction is such a, a big problem with ADHD people. Almost twice as many people who have the diagnosis of ADD will end up being addicted to one thing or another. 
However, when they look at, at people who were treated, that is treated with medicine as an adolescent, the numbers get close to normal in terms of those who potentially go on to be addicted. Whereas the, the, the people that have ADD and they, they weren't uh, treated, they have you know, twice as many people uh, involved with addiction of the one form or another. So there's lots of evidence. It's very reassuring, I think, for people to hear because particularly people, frankly, who like listen to a podcast li like ours, we're probably interacting with a, a, a higher density of holistically inclined people. Um, and there just can be some fear around medication, which, you know, I get. Uh, but again, it's something that we've really considered and looked at a bunch of options and are probably going to gonna try on at some point. Uh, so I, I would encourage people, particularly people who have significant symptoms that they're having a difficult time controlling through other mechanisms to really take a look at it. If that's a possibility that's available to you, because I, I mean, I have friends who've tried medication who it was just totally transformative for them, completely life-changing. And um, so the, the upside is really pretty, pretty extraordinary. If I could add kind of a perspective on it too. Um, so I'm, I'm careful about my license. I'm a psychologist, not a psychiatrist, so I can comment on medication, but I never render a professional opinion about whether someone should <laughs> start or stop or change their meds. I say, talk to your other doctor in that context. One thing I've seen pragmatically is that people can bring to bear, a person can bring to bear in the life of a child or their own life as an adult, a lot of non-medication interventions. And those are great. And one of your great services, John, as a card-carrying medical medication prescribing psychiatrist has been to emphasize these other important interventions, which certainly in the life of a child include a lot of nurturance. And in the life of an adult, a lot of connection, partly to balance the dings and bumps and bruises that someone who's more spirited is experiencing as they kind of bang up against tighter controls. I think of, uh, you know, metaphorically, Forrest has heard me use this, that there's kind of a normal temper temperamental range between turtles and jackrabbits with tweeners kind of in the middle. And it's tough to be a jackrabbit trapped in a turtle pen, you know, taught by turtles who are trying to train you to become a turtle, right? A lot of wear and tear adds up over time. Okay, so people can do a lot of non-medication interventions that may handle things, the issues of fit, perfectly adequately. On the other hand, pragmatically, many people will not do all those other interventions, which can sometimes include dietary changes, lowering inflammatory processes in their body that are distracting and are one more load, you know, on the person's executive functions, things like that. They just won't do them. They can't sustain them. It's not realistic. And so it's, it's, in the context of that then, that medication becomes pragmatically more useful as skillful means, because you're just not gonna do all those other things. And of course, there are people who will do those other things and get a lot of benefit from a psychostimulant medication of one kind or another. So for me, that kind of range that's pragmatic rather than a binary yes or no, do or don't, you know, is a, you know I found it to be a useful way to think about it. Oh, absolutely. We, we you know, if, if people can, so you can, can go for it and, and have enough activity and love and, and you know, uh, things that they're pursuing in their life, then they may, not, they may not need medicine. It's up to them. It's up to figuring out how much this, 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 this difference is affecting their lives. But you're right. You, you talk about the jackrabbits and turtles. We uh, talk about the farmers and hunters. And that's, that's hard for a hunter to sit in a classroom taught by a bunch of farmers and, and, and expecting you to just be there and, and, and sit and, and not be, jump up and want to see what the hell's going on outside. On the other side of the hill. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, John, oh, thanks so much for doing this with us today. Oh, squirrel. Squirrel! <laughs> <laughs> What a great note to end on. John, thank you so much for doing this with us today. This was like utterly fantastic. You're just a total gem. And, and I just really appreciate it. And thank you for your work as well. It's really helped a lot of people.
Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me on. It, it was good to see you again, Rick, and hope to see you again sometime. I really love today's conversation about ADHD with Dr. John Rady. John is the author with Ned Halliwell of the new book, ADHD 2.0. I really couldn't recommend it more strongly if you or someone you know has ADHD, which I think probably includes most people at this point, or if you're just interested in learning more about ADHD. I've found it just a fantastic resource in my own life. It's been really helpful for my relationship with my partner, Elizabeth and has also just helped me develop such a better understanding of ADHD. And that's what we began with. What are some of the common misconceptions or misunderstandings that people still have about ADHD, even after there's been such an explosion of popular awareness of it as an issue that people have? And what John really emphasized is how there's a common framing of ADHD as specifically an attentional problem. It's right there in the name of it, right? Attention Deficit and Hyperactivity Disorder. But ADHD isn't so much a deficit of attention, it's a surplus of it with absolutely no control associated with it. It's basically like having a car that has the engine of a race car and the brakes of a bicycle. The problem isn't that your engine isn't big enough, but that you lack the brakes that most people have to apply that engine as effectively as you could. And even that framing is, is a bit of a framing of deficit. It's a bit of a framing of ADHD as, hey, a disorder, again, right there in the name. But the truth is that ADHD has a whole set of, of symptoms or presentations or traits that are associated with it that range from definitely inconvenient in a modern world to these completely beautiful aspects and, and really wonderful parts of, uh, of a personality structure that can be incredibly beneficial for people who have it. These are strengths like a great deal of creativity and imagination, a real ability to sense into the emotions of other people and act as a kind of emotional weather vane for a group. A generosity, a unique and active sense of humor. And one of the things that in the book he refers to as an itch to change the conditions of life. And this can be associated with the ability to innovate that we talked about during the conversation as well. And in this way, John frames ADHD in such a wider and, and broader context than the way that most people think about it. It's not this narrow ailment that needs to be essentially beaten out of people, um, where people just need to regulate themselves as hard as humanly possible in order to overcome their deficient brain. It's not that. It's a set of traits. There are strengths. There are some vulnerabilities. It is a whole brain thing. What do we do to accentuate the strengths and create a context that supports those strengths and a context wherein those strengths can operate at their maximum power without being as affected by some of the vulnerabilities. We talked for a while in the middle of the conversation about what's going on in the brain of somebody who has ADHD. And John highlighted these two different networks. Those are the task positive network and the default mode network. The task positive network is associated with the feeling of being in the zone or highly focused on something. While the default mode network is what your brain defaults to, it's right there in the name, again, when it's not doing anything else. It's when you're imagining or daydreaming, and maybe when you're ruminating, although, as John said, that's got some interaction with the task positive network as well. And for the brains with people who have ADHD, they tend to get sucked into the default mode network, even when they're focusing on something. There's like this constant vacuum pull back to it in the brain, which is one of the reasons that it can be tough to sustain attention over a long period of time. On the other side of the coin, because ADHD is all about these two very strong sides of the coin that both exert a lot of influence, it's very possible for people with ADHD brains to uh, fall into intense periods of hyperfocus. What John John described this as the desire to get to completion, the feeling like they just have to finish this thing, and they're almost there, and if they just finish it then they'll be able to let it go or focus on something else. In terms of practically working with ADHD, there were three things that we emphasized during the conversation and a fourth one that I'll name here in the outro. And the three that we talked about were the importance of social connection, the value of exercise and movement, and then the possibility of using medication. 
The fourth one that I'll name here in the outro is the importance of setting up an environment, a set of circumstances around you that are supportive of your unique brain. And this gets to something that ran underneath the conversation as a whole, which is the importance of context. We have a particular kind of context in modern life, right? You're sitting at a desk a lot, you're working at a computer a lot, you're staring at a phone a lot. Uh, maybe you're listening to this podcast while you sit in your car and drive to your desk job, whatever it is that people are doing. And that's one context, but that isn't the context that humans existed in, basically biologically modern humans existed in for 97% of the time that we've been on this earth. And in those different contexts, maybe not our modern one, having something like ADHD, having a uh, an excess of energy, an excess of interest, an excess of imagination could be profoundly useful for a group of people who are trying to survive under very harsh conditions. And I would just encourage people who are listening to this who themselves maybe have ADHD, or if you're somebody like me who's the partner of somebody with ADHD, to really think about ADHD in that way, that it is a context-based liability. It is a context-based issue. And this really takes us out of a framework of it where we're blaming a person for the way in which their unique brain works. Because really what's going on here is there's an issue of fit. There's an issue of fit between the brain of the person and the circumstances that they find themselves in. And so a key place of intervention is, okay, how can we make that fit a little bit smoother, a little bit softer, a little bit kinder to people? I got a ton out of today's conversation. I got even more out of reading John's book, which again, he wrote with Dr. Ned Hallowell. And I hope you did as well. Uh, it was great doing this. We've been really delinquent in talking about ADHD directly on the podcast. I am sure we will have many more episodes that include either a deliberate focus on ADHD or it as part of a different kind of conversation, maybe a broader conversation on other topics. Uh, there are some people who I don't want to, you know, say too much now and we haven't really confirmed them, but we have some experts that will probably be coming on the podcast in the near future. Uh, to talk about ADHD, and I'm really looking forward to those conversations as well. If you've been enjoying the podcast for a while, I'd really appreciate it. If you would take a moment to subscribe to it wherever you're listening to it now on. If you're watching us on YouTube, hey, you can subscribe to my channel. You can just find me as Forrest Hansen. If you're uh, listening on Spotify or listening on Apple Podcasts and you haven't clicked the subscribe button yet, well, now's a good time. If you haven't, we'd also appreciate it if you would take a second to leave a rating and a positive review, maybe tell a friend about it. It's the best way that we have to reach new people. And if you'd like to support us in other, perhaps monetary ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for the cost of just a few dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a whole bunch of bonuses in return. Until next time, thanks for listening and I'll talk to you soon.